Hi, hello everyone. Uh, this is Patrick Kaiser from TechArc, and today we are with the second part of our first international, uh, you know, series of TechFlix, where uh, the objective is uh, bringing in global leaders on various technology, uh, you know, uh, subjects uh, who share their perspectives and insights with the audiences to understand what's happening globally. Uh, on various, uh, you know, subjects and domains and how probably, you know, they could contribute when they think of India in terms of their respective domains and how India should be kind of prepared. So I have an eminent, uh, you know, a panel of experts with me. Uh, I have Mishi Chaudhary. Uh, I think everybody who is into the cybersecurity domain knows her. She joins us from uh, New York. I have Burgess Cooper, who is the you know, partner for ENY in India and also heads the cyber security practice there. And I have Carl Kim with me, who is the CEO for Boloro, uh, also joining us from uh, New York. Uh, hi, welcome, uh, panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Okay, uh, so just setting the context and for the benefit of uh, audience also, uh, I'd like to welcome them also on this show. Uh, so over the next 40-45 minutes, we'll try to discuss uh, what's, what's ex exactly happening with data privacy and security as we are moving towards a connected world. Uh, you know, the, the definition of connection or connectivity is changing. You know, we are non, no longer connected by a few maybe devices, we are almost connected down the clock. Uh, we may be actively connected or we may be what I would like to call passively connected where we don't know we are connected, but we are actually connected. So how does the landscape change? What are its implications? And how, you know, how does the security play out there? That's, that's the context what we want to discuss over the next uh, 40, 45 minutes. And then we'll open for Q and A. Uh, you know, very. Uh, we would be happy to take questions to the, to the experts. I'll only request the audience whenever they have to raise a question. So there is a raise hand icon on the right side of the panel. They can just raise hand, and we can bring them live onto the panel, and they can ask the question directly to the uh, experts. However, we will will definitely look at you know if they are asking the right uh, set of questions, which can be. Uh, by the panel today. Uh, so starting with you, Mishti, you know, I want, uh, since you understand the, you know, the legal framework, the, uh, the regulatory aspect, the policy aspect of this domain, I want to understand from you, how, how, how is the legal scenario changing uh, in this connected, you know, society or connected world? And how are the policies and definitions essentially changing in this domain? Sure. Thank you for having me here. And um, let me know at any point in time if uh, you cannot hear me or um, there are other technical issues or any if you want to stop me and if I'm speaking too fast. Um, so I, I can't see the audience. It's a little odd to talk. But uh, um, I'm guessing, or I would, ha I would have otherwise asked if I was there in person about how many of you have a spy satellite in your pockets. Uh, I'm referring to your smartphones, obviously. Um, and considering how many of you are now working from home, um, the questions about whether the devices that you have logged in into this webinar are your personal devices or your work devices, all of those um, matter these days in terms of the questions which we are asking. What um, has happened to the human race over the last 30 years was what um, we might call um, unintended consequences of building a little thing we call internet. From the builder's point of view, the internet was supposed to be the greatest machinery of human race and something which we had ever devised unparalleled um, for achieving what is really meant by democracy and the vanquishing of ignorance, making available to every brain, every creation and idea ever had to all of us. But that's not where we live now um, because we allowed the network which we faced outward to allow every brain on earth to learn and liberate people by destruction of ignorance to turn inward. 
and acquired as its primary role the acquisition of capitalism fueled gain so now what we are witnessing obviously and i um i have to keep this in the context that we're still at very very early stages it's only 2007 iphone is launched and we're in 2020 so as much as it seems as if we've always lived in this world um we are still at the very very beginning um we are witnessing and taking part still in the greatest information technology revolution in the history of mankind we go from a tr we are transitioning from a largely paper based world to a fully digital world and that's definitely true in my area which is law but it's true in various other areas as well so as part of this transformation we continue to push the computers closer to the edge um and the edge today is the already vast world of uh, the internet of things uh, today is organizations regardless of wherever their physical location might be are increasingly likely to belong to global digital ecosystems um call will later talk about this more but monetary transactions are what often link these ecosystems together but uh, the other the other currency which we are talking about today is data i don't like the analogies but there are definitely a zillion analogies whether it's the oil air blah 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 you can put in whatever uh, is your jam these days but data does bring um opportunities but it also brings a lot of um responsibilities as one would say because it does introduce risk around the fair and lawful handling of personal data so um historically and history is really not very long here but uh, enterprises have treated data privacy as a catch up game um they have responded to regulatory requirements only when and if they must but uh, obviously things are now changing now customers expect transparency and control over their personal data no matter how little or more they understand about it and thanks to a lot of other universal regulations uh people are moving more towards an understanding of what's going on the numbers are um uh, mind boggling the sheer amount of data some iot devices or anything else uh can generate ftc's very old report now i would say because everything gets old very fast these days um ftc said in their internet of things and privacy security report that fewer than 10000 households can generate 150 million discrete data points every day that's one data point every 6 seconds for each household and so because these numbers are really really high and all our lives are now so interlinked the concerns over consumer privacy have also peaked in recent years and um fed up by a steady stream of incidents that range from uh, the equifax hack to the nefarious gaming of social media uh, data for political purposes i think the policy makers also have begun to to at least think about uh, working on behalf of the consumer so when you said that how the regulatory spaces changes is it's also that privacy although not a novel idea um but is also become much more complicated now because of the advent of global markets and digital tech in our postmodern world information based society one is information privacy which is what we talk about data etc but the other aspect which is the old school privacy which is bodily privacy they also still remain prevalent and relevant um consumers face a an endless stream of lengthy user agreements and hastily click through accept because lawyers like us try to jam everything into complicated legalese so that you are constantly confused um but they also just never realize when they are scrolling down what rights they might be giving away and the information consumers provide then they land up in large databases and those databases have a potential to be mined for a lot of uses including marketing opportunities purchasing recommendations or other services 
there is of course facial recognition voice identification and it also tracks our movements in real world at smart at homes smart appliances are there um motion sensing lights which people love these days thermostats etc so they all continue to collect data about us wherever we are going and coming so as a lawyer as much as i love definitions but because you asked a global question it has also evolved over time if in the us when we started with whether you were the louis uh, sorry the warren and brandeis camp who said that privacy was my right to be left alone or the us fourth fourth amendment which gives right against um unlawful searches and seizures or the european union's way of thinking about it which is that there is human dignity and a right to private life and that is why privacy flows from there or to the indian way and india recently did as in like just 3 years ago recognize that right to privacy is part of right to life um which is article 21 of india's constitution no matter what you say or what you do um there are certain aspects of privacy each of us have understood and um, uh, different people react differently based on what their political experience has been what their business backgrounds has been but overall i think the regulators have also now understood that you can just sit and not do anything so what we have seen is that uh, the the new universal regulations have been coming us is a more sectoral based um e economy I'm, I'm, where I'm every sector something you hear um nishi i think you know we'll we'll come to us you know in our uh, you know subsequently i just want to move on to burgis you know, and you know he is somebody who is uh, you know probably helping out so many brands and and these are very very you know large companies whom he's i think day in day out helping with you know protecting data protecting their assets protecting everything eventually uh, these days so so burgi is coming to you how has the scenario changed like what kind of new maybe devices applications are we seeing which are getting attached in a typical enterprise domain i think you know as you will be talking more about that and and what kind of you know threats are then emanating out of you know such kind of a thank you faisal and thanks mishi for a great uh, in depth introduction of the legal world so uh, i think let me tell you what trends are happening right now clearly the first trend we are seeing is the attack surface is company is tremendously increased right earlier days you would have a very desktop based environment and you would have a few users would be allowed to work probably off site sales people that scenario has turned on and said and today 98% of people are working from home uh, or different places and so the attack surface area increases take that forward with a lot of iot devices integrating in smart factories and manufacturing especially in the pharma retail uh, in oil and gas uh, again the attack surface area increases all of these have a component to secure from a security perspective but many of these let's say in automobile world uh, let's say a tractor company today track uh, tracks uh, when is the oil change uh, scheduled to be done but also at the same time checks where is the tractor moving in a in a geolocation field so the settings of privacy or where am i or how am i driving patterns and use that for insurance so you really uh, it's very tough for a person to understand how much he or she is being tracked and here i'd like to go to some of the guiding principles what uh, basically uh, define our, our privacy in today's world clearly if the first guiding principle i see is privacy is a very very personal thing as mishi also mentioned people often share more with the others than they tr uh, whom they trust one's person's own risk tolerance for sharing personal information with somebody face to face may be very different uh with somebody else who may do it in in person or on the internet the level of security and privacy to be implemented in a connected world will depend on the person using it the more connected the world becomes the more data that is shared among people companies governments and ecosystem security a traditional yeah, challenge for many device manufacturers uh, speeding towards early adoption with the automatic security updates to 
regulations and laws promoting secure protection, uh, the IoT devices will continue to present more risks. And the last one, the same user devices that are used to connect the world uh, and make it a better place, also sometimes become a threat and make it more dangerous. Uh, thereby, at, at the hackers use, using it to get detrimental purpose. So it's a very balancing act. The truth story is, uh, we ourselves allow and let in people to our personal world. Sometimes people expose much more on the connected world than they would expose in a real world. But the risks are here and true uh, and quite in, in our face. It's up to us really to make that choice of how much we allow. Uh, but our connected world is expanding much more than what we thought it would. Back to you, Faisal. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Burgess, for uh, a comprehensive, uh, yet very precise, you know, introduction of the scenario, you know, giving us a view of what's happening exactly. Uh, moving on to you, Carl. I, you know, since you come from uh, a domain where, where, you know, you are, where you're trying to, uh, I think, add that layer of trust, I would say, uh, where people could transact uh, comfortably. So what is the scenario, you know, out there? Has the trust been built or, you know, we are still kind of skeptical uh, while we get into uh, serious business, serious stuff on internet, like, you know, doing financial transactions. So what's, what's, what's the scenario? Out there? Sure. Uh, and first of all, thanks for the opportunity to speak with all of you today. And uh, thanks to Mishi and uh, Burgess for those uh, introductory remarks, which really, I think, you know, set the stage uh, well for, for the explanation. So we all, I think, have come to the realization that the internet is not a secure place. It was built to disseminate uh, massive amounts of information, but it was not built to be a secure place to do transactions. And we heard about data protection and privacy and how data has really become the new currency. And so many people do not appreciate that they're being tracked and that so much information about them is being stored and used by businesses. So at Beloro, we take note that the internet is not secure. Uh, the operating system is too easily compromised and data protection and privacy and security really should be in the hands of each individual consumer. So we've come up with a solution that is multi-factor. We use the physical phone you possess and a memorized secret that you know, a PIN or a password, but also multi-channel. We are separating the identity verification and transaction validation from the internet and the operating system using the secure signaling channel of the mobile phone, push USSD or network initiated USSD. And this layers a message on top of and separate from the internet-based activity so that the user itself is deciding if they want to verify their identity or they want to go forward with a transaction or other activity. And with our solution, no personal biometric data is being used. And it's not required that anybody is tracking the whereabouts of the user. Just like the user has historically gone up to an ATM with a physical bank card, what they possess, and a memorized pin, what they know, think about the world we're in now. Everything was going digital before COVID-19. Now with COVID-19, as you said, close to 100% of people are working from home. We're doing absolutely everything online. And when we do venture outside, nobody wants to touch a public device. Nobody wants to touch an ATM keypad. Nobody wants to touch a point of sale device, a finger scanner, an iris scanner. We, we, we don't want to touch these things. We want to keep our hands to ourselves. We want to keep ourselves as healthy as possible. And really, from our point of view, the best way to have true security and true data protection and privacy, and also to help public health by avoiding contact with public devices is to put everything absolutely safely and securely in the hands of each individual consumer. And that's exactly what Beloro is doing uh, with our multi-channel and multi-factor authentication approach. Okay, uh, great, great call. Uh, you know, uh, 
I, I, you know, what I, what I understood is probably yes, the layer has got more secure, and and you know, you have probably found out an alternative where you know authentication is done on a separate system, and probably transactions on another system. Uh, yes, looks like uh, you know it is more uh, secure, but experts like Burgess would have the final call probably on this, how secure that is. Uh, now, coming back to you, uh, uh, you know, Michelle. The answer there, Faisal, is, is as secure as you allow it to be. <laughs> uh, okay. Some of them do have a configuration setting. It's up to you how much you want to let go of your own public data. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so coming to you, Mishi, uh, you know, again, and, and you know, we, first of all, you know, I was, I was happy that there's a lot of law uh in technology you know otherwise as a, as a consumer very honestly you know i've always you know scrolled down those i and i just said i accept everything you know because so coming to uh, coming to two two scenarios out there one i want to understand when we when we look upon technology we always look upon you know countries like us so so how has the regulatory scenario uh you know kind of changed in us due to connectivity due to this connected world scenario and and what would be your maybe set of recommendations for india which is now it's now kind of you know getting into that era uh, where we look uh, i think holistically around these kind of issues when we are talking about smart cities when we are talking about you know many other connected you know ecosystems so what's what's your view on that and second uh, probably like you know what is an alternative for a user like me if i don't want to give my consent I want to use those services. I want to use those apps. But if I don't give any consent, I, you know, I can't. I can't get through. So, so what is the legal probably remedy out there for for me? Uh, sure. Um, you said that you're glad that there's too much law here. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, mostly um, uh, law is always two steps behind what. Uh, the government is doing and technology is three steps ahead. So you can imagine how far behind law is. So, um, uh, and it's a very complicated thing to explain to people who are our judges because they are expected to be experts into everything. And this tends to get a lot more complicated. Um, so I would say that uh, law has a lot of catching up to do. But even when the law does that catching up, for example, um, uh, the Euro European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, which is GDPR as everybody knows it, uh, it's been now into existence for almost two years and we are seeing a lot of reports, etc. cetera. Um, but, uh, and it is doing some good job and it's not doing some things as great as one would expect. But um, um, as a consumer, our expectation is that um, I have a lot of things to do in my life. I don't have time for all of this. And the, whether it is my government or the, the digital structure around me, all of you are forcing me to move my various daily activities online. And then now you're also telling me that the burden of all the issues, whether they're legal issues or protecting my own data or privacy, that's also on me. I can't handle all that. So users are definitely overwhelmed and the regulators have picked up on that. And that is why we have seen the GDPR. Then since January this year in 2020, um, we have seen the California Act, which is CCPA, which has come up. Now, um, US has traditionally been um, a sectoral regulator regulatory structure. We have uh, GLBA for the finance industry. We have HIPAA for the health industry. Um, and uh, we've had COPPA, which is uh, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. But we don't have a comprehensive, um, comprehensive law which covers privacy at a federal level. California has taught us that what they would like to see and what should be something in future. And that's why companies like Microsoft have decided that they're going to extend that to every state, not just California, what the requirements are. Some companies have also decided that what GDPR requires, because that's a really high standard, they're going to ensure that that works out everywhere. 
India's draft personal data protection bill was introduced in the parliament after two, three years of going on here and there in December. They haven't moved on anywhere. And um, unfortunately, there are so many moving parts of all of this. Like India carved out something called use of non-personal data and formed another committee. So um, I think the consumer, what the consumer rightly wants is that they want simplicity and they want ease of understanding what is being done with their data. And what they also want is some control that they should be able to opt out of things which they don't like. And they can only make that decision if they understand something. Most of these regulatory structures are based on consent and which you rightly said, you don't read, everybody scrolls down, you just say, I accept. And that is taken to be your cons consent and you like handed over your first child to somebody and you'll never know because you never read. And that's why what they're thinking is that why is my government not coming to my rescue? But I have to say that um, A, uh, we all also don't realize how important these things are. It's only recently that people have even started to talk to me about it in much different terms than it used to be. Earlier, it was like, oh my God, you, you think too much. It's so great when I can actually map everywhere I went in the last one month by Google Maps. And now it suddenly scares them because so much of that data is not only used to sell you the right pair of shoes, which you wanted at a, at a discount, but it is also going to make decisions about how much uh, will be your insurance premium. And uh, in more serious cases about people's um, employment and such cases. So, so, so what is happening is that consumer wants simplicity. Consumer has a ton going on. In India, we did a lot of work and also uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, and Singapore recently with COVID on contact tracing apps because technology is a panacea and tech companies can do everything. So everybody said, oh, con manual contact tracing is so difficult. Here is an app, do everything on it. Now, the, the customers were like, so I am in a pandemic and now I have all these other stresses and now you want me to think about privacy because what is happening or what is still happening in India is that the data which the government is telling and India was the only country which forced everybody to download that app. That's why the numbers are 140 million. And thereafter, they were like yo-yoing between yes and no, whether it is mandatory or it's voluntary. But 140 million people downloaded. And thereafter, the government said, you know what, whatever the remnant data is, we are going to collect that data and use it to build a national health stack. And suddenly everybody is, so I don't have control whether I can, I can download an app or not that app doesn't really work. It is insecure in some ways. And you as the government is supposed to come to my rescue, but you're saying you're handing over all that data to somebody I don't understand, will also start determining my health insurance premiums. So um, these are complicated matters. I am going to say, as Burgess said, there are few things people can do um, in order to control their own privacy. It's not always a good idea that everything is out open there. It's not, we are not celebrities that we, although internet likes to make us feel that if you give us all the information, we'll turn you into those celebrities. But uh, uh, you can control some bits. Um, uh, you also want to, you like those uses. As you said that I would love to have, I like photo sharing. I would like my friends to see what I did yesterday when I, if I went to the beach or just talk to my parents and say, this is how my video chat works. But I don't want somebody snooping in on that chat, taking those buzzwords and next time I look at Amazon, the pricing is very different for me. So I think that people are now beginning to wrap their heads around what is at stake. But uh, facts are being made on the ground much faster then regulation can catch up. So we can do is that we can try to understand what the limitations are. Demand products which actually tell us that privacy is front and center and also force our own regulators to say, do your work. It's not my job to learn all of this. It's your job to do it. 
So if we can do all of that, it will at least move us into the direction where we are. And the companies, because data security is so now related about what's going on, some of the companies will do it because that's what everybody demands and the regulators demand. Otherwise, the fines are really big. But the, some of the companies, their business model is surveillance capitalism. So they're not going to do it. Mishi, just a point out here, and Faisal just add to a different slightly flavor from Mishi mentioned. Uh, while many companies think of data security and privacy much more as a cost and a damage control and after a breach happens and what not to do, I think some companies taking what Mishi said a fit further in a different direction actually try and leverage good cybersecurity practices, good data privacy practices as a positive brand differentiator. If I as a consumer know uh, that you will take proper due care of my data, not misuse it, and it's very hard to, but still, you know, do the right stuff, I will feel obliged to bank or work more with you or use your app more or whatever you do, be more with you in the business. So it could actually be a very, very positive brand differentiator if companies are adopting that in a very positive way, not just an event happened, breach, data lost. Uh, it could mean a much more different level. So I think that's interesting because, you know, so far, probably, you know, uh, I, at least I have not come across any such conversation where, you know, uh, somebody is telling that cyber security and, you know, taking care of your security can be a brand differentiator. You know, so I go to boards, I go and uh, go to lots of board assurance in many companies. And that's the biggest line which board members are saying, hey, it's a cost or is it a positive differentiator? The money is the same. The outlook changes. And few companies are beginning in that direction and it's a wave, but uh, it's, it's, it's to take its time. Well, cars company is that. Yeah, if I if I could add, uh, you think about it in the e-commerce world, when we see how much fraud is out there and how much retailers are losing in uh, fraudulent transactions, when you can put real cybersecurity in place and give consumers a comfort level, those consumers will go forward with their internet-based transactions, and the retailers could even offer uh, some discounts and some better deals to their consumers when their consumers are using proper cybersecurity and fraud is eliminated. Think about the ridiculous cost of fraud globally. And if you could eliminate that cost and put benefit back into the hands of consumers, that's a win-win for everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, you know, uh like when we when we just look at the say the ad fraud side you know which is just maybe tip of the iceberg and it's still around 30 35 percent of spends on the campaigns which is huge and and then there are now i think new issues coming out you know like the brand safety issue for instance you know how brand reputation and image is getting tarnished due to those spends uh, I'd, I'd like to move on to burgess again here uh, so burgess my question to you would be uh, uh you know there are, there are probably three domains of security. You know, one we have on the hardware side, then we have the network security, and then the probably apps and software application side. Uh, now, somehow I feel like uh, we are more concerned and we have been more talking about hardware and network, even if, you know, I look from the Indian perspective and we are still very, very, I think, far off from awareness around the application and, you know, uh, software side of the issues. Uh, one, I want to understand what's your view on that. And second, uh, now, if, if we all understand that, yes, there is some improvement on the security side, on the, on the awareness and understanding and people realizing, you know, it being a, an issue out there. So has it, you know, kind of, has it resulted in any kind of increase in spends on, on the security uh, for, for some organizations? Sorry, you have to unmute yourself. You I did 16 fire chat chats. I was uh, comparing on 16 fireside chats and the message there is clearly uh, and one is media and you speaking of events like these. I think there's been exponential rise. If not anything else, that's clearly influenced an awareness uh, on the cyber risks, more so during COVID times because the push to digital is accentuated. Uh, money will be throttled out, but it will be given where you require. 
maybe at the edge, uh, as Mishi mentioned, where the risks are. The risks are moved away probably in these scenarios, more from networks to the edge. Uh, more products of end security, end user security will sell or cloud will sell than probably a network. Maybe because people are uh, want the end users to be much more secure and you know, maybe next one year you won't go back to the office. So yes, uh, in a nutshell, awareness is, is coming. Awareness is trying to move to behavior, to habit. Uh, the younger generation probably is much more tuned to this, though they are much more give it away uh, if they, they're not careful. But uh, the applications also are catching on. Uh, in our era, we used to live more on networks and routers and uh, the app world is clearly increasing. Cloud native is now picking up in, in deep, uh, strong form. Many companies are going digital first, cloud native first. So that trend's happening. It's going to accentuate in the next 18 months. Uh, the wave's begun. It's only a matter of time how fast we adapt to it. Okay. Uh, great. Now, I think I think we have already crossed midway, you know, and I would like to now, you know, move on to the next side where we try to, you know, talk more about what can be done and what should be done. Uh, and then we'll open up for Q&A if we could have any questions from the audiences. I'm sure there will be some questions out there. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to, you know, uh, shift the sequence or change the sequence and start with Carl. So Carl, uh, what how do you see the Indian fintech ecosystem and, and what could be your recommendations for the Indian fico, you know, fintech ecosystem in terms of, uh, you know, what, what best practices to continue, what to kind of tweak, uh, what, what would be those maybe key, uh, you know, three, four suggestions from your side? Sure. And, and India is such a, an incredible market in and of itself, just because of the tremendous population, and the diversity of people, you know, living in uh, the biggest of cities and, and the most rural of areas. So you really need solutions that can work for everyone. So our approach, for example, at uh, Beloro is to have an approach that is compatible with any mobile phone. So you could be using a smartphone and doing everything uh, on the smartest of smartphones. It doesn't matter who the manufacturer is, or you can have the most basic feature phone in a rural area. Any place you are in India, you're going to be able to get a push USSD notification. So this is going to give you real security in your hands, no matter which type of telephone you have. And that is just you know a phenomenal uh, advantage that Beloro is trying to bring to the market. The other thing we see in the India FinTech space is the importance of moving away from cash the importance of transparency and the importance of real financial inclusion. And to have financial inclusion, you really need a credit history. You need people to know you exist and you need people to know that you are a good credit risk. You really pay your bills. And unfortunately, in so many parts of India and really so many parts of the world, if people have been paying their bills for many years in cash, and there's no record of that, nobody's tracking it. You could be a great credit risk, you always pay your bills, but you just don't have that credit history that you could demonstrate to a bank to achieve credit and, and get real financial inclusion. So one of the things we're doing at Beloro is not only allowing each individual consumer to identify themselves and validate each transaction, but an audit trail is created of every transaction they have completed and that audit trail becomes proof of credit and that credit history becomes something you could take to a bank and really demonstrate your credit worthiness and then get the type of financial assistance in the form of a loan that might actually help you really build your business so you think about all of the small businesses across uh, a country as diverse as india and how people need to be tied together in a digital economy and they need to be able to get access to lines of credit. To, to us, these are absolutely fundamental things in order to bring the society forward you know, in a digital world, uh, giving people real security, uh, real financial inclusion. Okay, um, great. I think some, some really valid points and you know, we'll try at TechArc, we'll try to really you know, push them across to you know, uh, the relevant stakeholders as much as possible. Uh, 
moving on to you, Burgess, you know, uh, what would be your key, uh, probably, you know, suggestions uh, and to, 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 I would say, enterprises when we look at, you know, uh, we have the, la you know, the, the, the large scale enterprises, I think they are pretty much sorted out uh, as regards the security. But then we have a very big SMB segment in India. And, and you know, I think security takes, a, you know, a backstage there. So what would be your recommendation specifically to these different sets of, uh, you know, organizations? And uh, maybe, yes, later on, we will talk about, you know, individual. So I like your supposition that every large company in India is sorted out. If that would happen, then every other security vendor would be out of business. And I can see Michi laughing. No, I, I meant at least, you know, they have access to you. Well, so does everyone. Uh, and believe me, our focus is mid markets, not just uh, top the stock market. Yeah, you're right. They have done what they could to a large extent, some of them or many of them, most of them. But mid markets is where the rush is. So clearly the steps of what I advise them and actually specialize in some of that sector is don't invest like a bank. Don't invest like a telco. Your risks are very different. I come from both of these. Invest firstly benchmark in any journey where you're an improvement journey. You need to know firstly, where am I? You know, that's the honest truth. Firstly, where am I? Where am I compared to my, uh, relative to my, my own industry? So if I'm a pharma company, how do I benchmark with pharma? If I'm manufacturing, how do I manufacturing or healthcare or wherever? Where am I? How do I benchmark with my colleagues? Who's the best in class in my business? Who's the best in class in that sector? Once I have that, I know where I am I to where I need to be. It makes a roadmap. So whenever I'm a, a CISO or a CIO gets asked by the board, hey, how secure are we? You know, are we secure? Very, very vague questions. You know, it's a double-edged sword. If you say you're not secure, then why the hell are you there? If you say you're secure and you get hacked, you said you're lying. Both ways is a trap question. So the way we do it is you get a, get a framework. You say here's the benchmarking parameters, a 20-point framework. You say we are as secure as we can be. Here's the score. Uh, I'm not as secure in the software security, maybe at a software form, I don't need to be. But guess what? In security for IoT and healthcare, I'm as good as a bank in the same level because uh, for me, network security is equally important as somebody. So measure where you think you are, where you ought to be, make the map gap, make a delta and go and tell your board, you are, give me money, here's an objective, here's how secure am I. You want to get more secure, more funding, please. You know, that's the only way a CIO or CISO can be honest. Otherwise, and if he says, I, have a, I want a firewall or I want EDR, how, how will the CFO know how it will improve? This much money you give me will improve this sector. So very clear, that's the message I give to all the SMBs. Uh, you're right, everyone can't afford a very, very high-end CISO and a network security specialist and a forensic guy and an architecture guy. So CISO as a service, data privacy as a service is taking big um, uh, sort of uh, steps nowadays. Uh, people are Give me one headcount, uh, two months of the year, I'll use them as privacy, three months I'll use them as a uh, architecture for uh, AppSec. So CISO as service, privacy as service are the new mantras, uh, especially for the mid-market sector, who can utilize the expertise of people who help large firms, uh, get the, the benefits of those and utilize it in their, in, in their slightly stock, uh, lower budgets. Okay, great. One more, one more probably linked question. Uh, so, you know, we look at when we talk of security, we somehow, you know, overshadow it with cyber security. And I don't know, you know, there could be many definitions of cyber security that a person could think of uh, from his understanding and what all. Uh, but are we also missing the digital side of it somewhere, you know, uh, probably where there are new kind of threats, you know, um, there are these malware attacks, there are attacks happening through uh, maybe you know these ad ads being displayed and you know all those kind of threats threats out there are we missing at that part because i personally feel the level of uh, awareness on that side is still low in in even you know some of the very digitally advanced or digital first uh, organization so uh is it uh low maybe not is it where it ought to be maybe not and they are somewhere in between uh some of the company digital first have clearly understood cyber plays a very, again, positive differentiator role. And they know that uh, if it's an online company and they go down, that the whole business model goes down. A manufacturing company's website goes down, okay, it's bad reputation, but if a company digital first, if they go down, they completely down. 
so these companies are much more ahead in their recognizance in their spending in their environmental awareness for cyber have they reached the pinnacle and are we sort of you know completely secure the answer is clearly no but uh, more so in companies are digital first but does that mean every product they have is secure not always you've seen lots of improvement areas and that's the whole nature you, know, you keep on improving uh, and as uh, mishi said maybe the compliance and the laws are a bit behind the hackers are much more ahead of anybody so it's it's sometimes a catch up game uh, you know they do the worst we try and do our best and some way you know, sometimes we win the battle sometimes they win and we catch up so that's how the story goes okay uh, great um, mishi now coming to you you know uh, and and this question i am trying yet to you know search for an answer you know i i have been trying and since i uh, i have a lawyer today with me uh, in this scenario in this connected scenario you know i i keep on giving examples so so uh, you know, I, I think you must be aware. So few years back, there was a law, you know, a, a long debate happening around the, you know, voice uh, call quality, you know, call drops and all that. And then we had around 17, 18 reasons why a call drop is happening or could be happening. So similarly, as we go into this connected world, you know, uh, uh, as an example, a hypothetical example, tomorrow, for instance, there is autonomous car and, uh, you know, there is an accident, you know, due to that autonomous car. Now, whom to ultimately blame? Have we have we got in, into some or or who? In other words, who is responsible? Is it network? Is it somebody else? Is it you know? There could be there could be so many elements. So have we have we started thinking in that direction or has any sort of clarity uh, been uh, you know achieved or arrived uh, on that side yet? Um, so. I if, if I were to give you a clear answer that whether I can go and look for something in law where um, if such a thing happens with whom the liability rise, uh, rests, um, lawyers will always find some statute which will apply. If I am in the United States, there is enough of tort law which is developed where I could find something about liability. Um, but there are several scenarios which are so new that I'm not first. I think our expectations should not be that that exact scenario we are going to find in law articulated. Oh, if such and such thing happens, then you can do this or you can do that. And it is a lot about criminal liability. It is a lot also. And these questions do determine how the insurance industry will be structured around all of this, because the underwriter also needs to know that where are the liabilities and the risks lie and with whom will they be lying in your example itself and i think that is still developing uh, about uh, self-driving cars but they're already interconnected cars so uh, self-driving we're a few years away from that but in interconnected cars also where things are now sometimes monitored by software and um, a lot of whether it is media, whether it is GPS systems, or there's a lot of stuff in our cars which is done by software. So the liability issues are the major issues and discussions obviously are happening in the industry where the standards are being developed for that. But uh, I, um, I will say this, that um, um, if, the, if the question is what happens in such a scenario, a lot of things happen. Um, who's driving the car, who's under control, who got, who died. So I'm going to give you a loyally answer. It depends. I, I, and I can, because I also can't point you to a statute say, oh, this statute says if you're indulging in such a thing or a smart device, which did X, Y, Z, you can do that. Now coming to the data point of view, because there are so many issues which are coming up now. Um, we try to find parallels in the offline world. Um, that is why you see the terms are also like that, like ransomware. Now we're trying to get a term from what we understand to a phenomenon which is very new for us um, for um, crypto jacking. Like it's, it's somebody hijacking a third party or a work computer to mine cryptocurrencies. That thing, that is not, if I were to look at any penal statute, um, I'm not going to find the term crypto jacking, but I'm going to be able to find terms like fraud. I'm going to be able to find terms like cheating. I can tell, and then based on that, I will come up with it. 
many of uh, the statutes do have something very specific and offenses are there in the indian example for uh, like um, uh, the it act from section i think uh, the 66 onwards has a ton of things which it covers um, uh, uh, revenge porn it doesn't say revenge porn but it does say that without the permission of somebody if you are going to disseminate uh, photographs of someone's private area then you can be punished about it so uh, I, I don't have I don't have, uh, say, uh, to give you a list of these other sections you can point to, but there are several of those. And it depends what jurisdiction you are, certain things under states in the United States, state law covers a lot more than the federal law covers. Uh, in India, it is different. Uh, some of the statutes like the IT Act does cover a few crimes and the others not. Um, I also will point out to one thing is that as scary as all of this sounds, um, and as Burgess said also earlier, that um, various entities, he's talking about companies, but I would say various entities are at different stages of understanding what's really going on in this ecosystem. And that includes whether it is civil society organizations who are engaging or the regulators or, um, uh, or the companies themselves. What I will caution is that the people who are most far behind again and again are the legislators and the government and are either, uh, from my point of view, in India, they get so fascinated by technology, they just let everybody, anybody who knows understand tech to say, to tell them to do whatever. Uh, but we can't also go in the other direction. Um, about oh we only we don't ever listen to business because without business where are we going to be and then we are not also going to be able to explore in future what new things we can do um i will say is that we shouldn't lose the sight of the fact that people are at the center of all of this um we do want the companies to have some understanding and leeway to experiment with with new things but we also need to have some rules which are not rigid uh, we can't expect technology to solve everything or anything digitized has to be better than the offline world. That's not always true. And this desire to have criminal law, which India is an expert on, compared to the rest of the world, one of the major problems in India is that everything is about crime. And then, you're, then our forces are not really trained to understand um, how to solve those things. Sometimes, um, if, if you watch popular culture, which is a reflection of the society, it is true that a lot of people who are investigative officers do not understand how various things of a smartphone work. I don't understand a lot of it, so you can blame them. And they have a ton of things to do. So when you make it a criminal offense, you're really, really putting everybody at a disadvantage. So um, uh, I, I think that the way to understand is that it should be efficient and there should be more damages which India doesn't do right now. Uh, and uh, that also helps in for everybody to understand the risks better. And um, in terms of whether it is companies or it is other people at various stages, uh, we're all developing, but um, uh, there is not going to be any future without a secure a data security, which is separate. And, uh, and privacy where the demand from the customer is, I am too tired, you cannot take away the bits which is now my money. It's not just some numbers which I see. It is my money. It is my livelihood. It is you collected my biometric data. That meant you can really take my identity and my entire life away. And now you're giving me rations based on that. You're giving me insurance based on that. So the customer is going to demand much more. And uh, the uh, regulators really have to get um, multi-stakeholder people to help them advise on policies. And I don't like uh, criminal law to be coming into the middle of all of this. And as sure. much as a lawyer I am, um, I like business and I like people to be able to push their rights also. So I don't want law to become a hurdle, but law to make it possible for people to get better practices uh, like privacy by design. Okay. Sure, I think I think uh, you know it. It sums up and explains everything. I'll just you know move on to audience if there are any questions. There is a question from Himanshu, 
Now, if he wants to ask it, you know, himself, I'd request him to raise the hand and I can bring him live to the audience. Uh, Himanshu, do you want to come live and ask the question or, you, you know, uh, if you could raise your hand and I can get you live or else. Uh, okay, I guess he wants us to ask the question. So his question is, uh, you know, how organization uh, incorporate, you know, privacy in design as default where developers are not experts in privacy. I think I think that's a, you know, a, huge gap he's kind of indicating to so there is a security team and developer team and developer team perhaps you know don't understand security that way so so uh, probably burgess if you could take this question and you know answer about it uh, so so how how do we tackle about this situation just to get the question right he's saying how do developers look at security am i rephrasing it well so he's he's saying you know how do organizations effectively tackle it when you know there's a probably discord between you know organize you know developers and the security experts because you know developers are primarily responsible uh, for, for application development and maybe they do not understand the security aspects that correct so that's why uh, the way you do it is you don't you don't let security come as an so as an afterthought as a bolt-on Oh, I have developers uh, coded the application. Now the security guy comes down holy and says all is rubbish and finds 50 holes and stops the go live. It goes back to production development and that again comes back. You do something secure by design. You train your developers right on in the start before the, the coding starts. You give them a framework. You give them a training. You told them how to code and more important now not to code. Then you do the, the testing and say, Okay, how many tests are really getting? And this is what I do for all companies where I sort of you know, consult and advise. Uh, for the developers who didn't do the training, what was the percentage of errors? For the ones who did the training, how much improvement? Who are my top five developers who make zero mistakes? Who are my last five developers who consistently disobey either by intent or by design or just not adapt and you take the right actions? There's no other way. You know, if you've got to ensure your developers are following a secure by design approach right from the start not uh, they are part of your extension of yourself you only should make them if you treat them as the other side then they'll always be the other side it's just how involved are you in their upscaling of security perspective okay i think i think yes uh, fair point probably yes i think now the solutioning and architecture is tackled in a different way and probably most of the i would say evolved organizations are addressing in that way uh where they do take care of security right from this beginning and it's not something which is looked up uh, at a later stage uh well I, I i don't know do we have any questions just a last call to audience if there are any questions otherwise you know i can move on to on from my side Faisal, back to you and i also yeah, get yeah so, sure objective what have you gained from the series what is your words of wisdom to us as panelists, uh, to Mishi, Carl, myself, and to the other uh, people? You know, why do you, why are you doing this, and what what is your intention, and how do you give back to society? Sure. Security? What is your sure sure sure? Okay, a couple of things. You know, uh, I think I think what I understood from this you know discussion and you know hearing hearing experts like you out in this domain, uh, you know. It's not that, you know, whether law or, you know, practices or technology, uh, they haven't moved with the requirements. So they are moving. Yes, they could be, you know, as Mishi rightly pointed out, there could be, you know, the speeds could be different. They are not right now, I think, uh, in harmony, you know, synchronized in terms of uh, reaching up to this stage. Uh, but I think the direction is right and we are moving in that direction where probably uh, I, I can never claim that we will ever be in a very we will be in a secure you know environment in a secure mode that you know one day we'll say okay now we have achieved security okay forget about it there will be new challenges that will be coming up but as we move into this connected uh, world where endpoints are increasing where the as I you know as I in the beginning said that we are probably uh, you know invariably also connected at times and we are not aware we don't feel we don't realize that we are connected. So I think those scenarios are getting addressed. 
there are legal frameworks there there is law which is uh, there to support us but yes it can it may not be that black and white that okay if you do this then this so it cannot be that kind of a uh, you know uh, a logical framework a kind of thing which we use in say programming there is no if then statement in law perhaps uh, so that's 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 i think a message out there uh, but yes uh, i think i think with 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 the right kind of advice with the right kind of uh, probably some practices which include probably you know talking to experts like uh, you know burgis in the beginning of uh, uh, you know uh, thinking of developing a technology or developing a solution i think many of the things can be taken care of in the beginning and you know uh, uh, itself however yes i think you know the consumer side is a concern you know where uh, i feel there as we get connected more and more people are getting connected to internet uh, uh, and and there is uh, you know uh, there's a, there's a sort of i wouldn't say they are economically backward but yes there is a strata which may not be digitally aware and and it's it, it perhaps has nothing to do with exposure nothing to do with income levels nothing to do with profession uh, or or so to say socio economic background but yes there is this uh you know uh, secure you know concern uh, which is growing as we move on as digitalization or digitization uh, digitalization sorry you know moves further and further goes deeper and deeper i think there are concerns because probably many people just sign up apps they don't know what they don't uh, probably understand what kind of permissions they are allowing you know if i talk from that perspective so yes that is that is out there and that's what i could you know conclude or gather out of whatever discussion we had uh, so far thank you for that i'm sure that i have i have two questions uh one is okay both are from amit so uh okay it's a very uh, direct question to you burgis so his question is there are some great solutions from security fraud prevention perspective but reaching to regulatory and making them understand the solution or change of their current approach is you know an, an uphill task so does an organization like eny give them that support to make them uh, you know hear and you know make their uh, maybe uh, voice uh, a bit stronger sure is it to the government regulators or to the executive in their own department i guess it's the first one so yeah the first one so yeah, yeah so we clearly were you know we are part, we are we are there on many forums and we can happily support uh, if there are genuine requirements to strengthen the cyber security and privacy uh of a particular product and helps the nation clearly we are able to sort of help support that journey okay great me uh, or anyone i'm happy to be the you know take the onus and say yes i'll be personally happy to take that onus and to influence it positively for the betterment of cyber security our data privacy that's great that's great to hear um, i think we don't have any more questions and we have also you know reached to the end of the time but just uh, you know coming back to all you know you three i want to have one last probably you know concluding remark from you so is my my question would be is this you know digital ecosystem a bit trustworthy than it was before or the situation is more or like the same starting from you burgis thank you so the way i played something what in ui we call trust by design you know you have security by design privacy by design but if you can build a digital system with trust by design which is a concept as well as solution then you are on the right path then you don't have to have the problems of developers fighting with security guys and the coders and then customers finding out you know it's a fundamental shift in thinking uh, and a trust by design framework is what you know is the order of the day and the future okay great uh call your your views on this sure i i think consumers are becoming more and more aware of the importance of identity verification and the importance of understanding exactly what is happening with their data what personal data is being collected on them and how companies are leveraging it and as mishi pointed out the regulators and the laws are typically behind the technology but as consumers become more and more aware of what's happening with their data and the regulators catch up and put laws in place to protect that data cybersecurity is going to be uppermost in people's minds and everyone should step back and and understand on a daily basis how am i protecting my identity what is happening with my data who's collecting data on me do i have true control over it 
And as those issues become more and more uh, prevalent, uh, we'll, we'll be in a better place. The whole world will be in a better place in terms of data protection and privacy. Uh, but, but at Beloro, again, we're trying to put security in the hands of individuals, which is really where it should be. Great, um, Mishi. Your your views on this? Is this a you know a safer, a trustworthy place? Digital. Um, I, from my point of view, um, we're always catching up. I I don't think that uh, no matter um, nobody can ever guarantee that uh, we're always secure. Uh, there are going to be risks, but that's that's life. Um, that's about anything. So whether it is state-sponsored cyber attacks or new various things which are going to come as challenges, um, these things were not, we were never even discussing these things 20 years ago. So um, of course, um, as uh, we will innovate, new challenges will come. So um, I will say that um, uh, consumers should understand that they do have power. Uh, and uh, smaller startups, smaller uh, uh, companies, all who are doing really innovative work also must appreciate that whether it is civil society organizations in the tech space or it is, it is trade associations, etc., they are eager to learn new things and take their voices also to the regulators. So they, are, they should understand that they have power new things which they are doing if they are brought to light and to the notice of anybody it would it's it's an ecosystem thing um so they're contributing to that the third thing i'm going to say is privacy by design also came on everybody's radar and uh, although it had been a practice for many companies who as burgess calls them digital first or people who are um uh, internet native or that's what they are but um, after gdpr said there is a requirement for privacy by design everybody had to fall in line because um, that's when the uh, companies also start paying attention because the fines are really big but as whether you're a small industry or you're a consumer you're an individual your rights matter your attention economy because that's how it runs your attention matters you can vote with your um, your money where you take your attention also, it really matters a lot. Uh, that's why the platforms have to really tailor to what consumers demand. So individuals should also keep demanding from whether it is companies, better products, or their regulators or representatives, uh, better protection, and not say that uh, um, various complicated things, whether it is cross-border data flows or data localization requirements, that they should say, this is not my job. I am at the center of all of this. Protect me in that sense and demand responsible, equitable, traceable and reliable um, uh, technologies because things like AI, et cetera, will have to come up with some kind of ethics, et cetera. And we are not always going to have law. So we will have best practices. We'll have norms. We will have guiding principles. So demand more, trust in your demands, and go and look for better practices. Because at the end of the day, we all have to protect ourselves also as we demand uh, from other people what they should be doing. Uh, great. I think nice way to kind of wrap it up. Uh, I would really, uh, and, and with that, we come to end of this uh, session. Uh, really, really very interesting uh, insights came up and, and that's the feedback we are getting from, uh, you know, the, the attendees also. Thank you for the feedback. I, I really thank all of you, uh, you know, Mishi, Carl and Burgess for joining us today. And I know for Mishi and Carl, it's an early morning and Burgess and uh, me would be kind of now uh, trying to set the day. Uh, I really thank all of you for attending, uh, including the attendees uh, uh, out there. We will be making this, you know, uh, conversation, uh, you know, available uh, in, in some days uh, and it will be made available, you know, offline for those who couldn't attend us today. And I hope, uh, you know, I do see you sometime very soon again on Tech Arc and we do uh, talk about uh, maybe some more deeper uh, perspectives of te uh, technology and security out there. Uh, with that, I think we come to an end. And uh, once again, thanks a lot for being with us today.